In the name of Jesus, welcome to Blessings Christian Church this morning. We still have a few people making their way in, and that's fine. Uh, I want to extend a very special welcome this morning to guests who have joined us for any number of reasons, not least the baptism of Sienna Eden de Gelder. A special welcome to relatives, to grandparents, brothers and sisters, cousins, friends of the de Gelders. It's such a treat to be able to witness the administration of baptism to a child of the covenant, and we have that particular privilege this morning. You may be a guest for a different reason. Perhaps you've just wandered into church for the first time, and if that's the case, a very special welcome to you as well. We're always so impressed with people who decide to come to church, who don't have a background of going to church, and we understand how intimidating that can be. Some of you have shared your stories with me, and uh, we're always so proud of people who make the decision to come to church and to find out what all happens here. Well, we do have uh, ushers who are stationed at the door. They can, of course, help you with logistical questions that you might have, the location of bathrooms, and so forth. I will also be at the back of the church at the conclusion of the service. I'd love to meet you if you're here for the first or second time. And uh, if you have any questions about blessings or about the Christian church more generally or about the person of Jesus, who he is, what he wants from us, please engage me after the service. You can also send an email to info at blessingshamilton.ca and those queries go to me and to Pastor Greg and we're often able to give prompt responses. You will also find in the chairs and the pews welcome cards that give you a variety of options to consider, one of which or two of which might apply to you. Please uh, fill out that card. You can hand it to me or to one of the ushers at the conclusion of the service, and we'll ensure that we are in touch with you promptly. I do want to remind you that at the conclusion of every service, we have to my left, by the purple banner, uh, members, of, uh, members of our prayer team uh, who are ready and willing to pray with you. And perhaps uh, in the course of this service, you're struck by something for which you want prayer. Please consider this option. Or maybe you're here uh, this morning with a burden on your heart. You're concerned about somebody. You're perplexed about something. And you want clarity through prayer. Please consider meeting with uh, people who are by this uh, banner at the conclusion of the service. You can also send an email to our prayer team at prayer-team at blessingshamilton.ca and we will ensure that your request is prayed for. I want to remind you also that at the conclusion of the service downstairs, we will have a luncheon in the fellowship hall. And this is especially for guests, but not only for guests. Um, it's a great way to meet other people in blessings and find out more about the church. There's always plenty of food. We usually have a gathering of some 60 people. Uh, please consider this uh, option uh, during the service for after the service. And then the YAC group, this is the Young Adults Collective, will be meeting in the overflow area after this service. They'll be having their own luncheon, and they'll also uh, be engaging in, in some kind of study, as I understand it. So that will be in the overflow area at the back of the sanctuary at the conclusion of this service. Please stand for the call to worship and follow the prompts on the screens in the sanctuary. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you. We're going to continue our worship and song by singing successively, Give us clean hands, he will hold me fast, an ancient of days.
as we ascend this morning into the courts of heaven to meet with the Ancient of Days and Jesus Christ, our Savior and Mediator, let us lift up our hearts. We lift our hearts to the Lord. It's our practice at Blessings Christian Church to have in our morning service a prayer of confession, and it's not simply a tradition that we follow. It is something that we believe is, in fact, important in terms of what the Bible teaches, because when we meet with God, we should never presume that we have access. We should never think that uh, we are deserving of his attention and his love. And we must, therefore, admit our sins, our failures, our brokenness when we meet with him, and he promises to forgive us and remove the obstacles to worship so that our worship can be pleasing to him. Let's bow our heads in prayer. I will pause for a time for you to confess your private and secret sins to the Lord as well. Let's pray together. Our dear Lord, we thank you for another very beautiful day and especially for the opportunity that we have to meet together to worship you. We thank you for these songs that we could just sing, for the musicians who assisted us in singing them. And we pray that you would receive all of the offerings of our worship in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, because we realize this morning that we are far from perfect people, we kind of stumble about in this world. We are guilty of doing many things we shouldn't do, of saying many things we shouldn't say. And you have instructed us in your word to love you with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And if we think about our lives, it doesn't take long if we have any integrity or honesty to recognize that there are many ways in which we fail to love you as we ought and to love our neighbors as we should. We pray in this moment that you would illumine our minds now to identify some of those ways in which we fall short of these commands to love you and to love others. When we go through this exercise, Father, of identifying our sins, we see them as bad news. And we're so grateful that in the Bible you unveil good news of forgiveness, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just and you will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And this morning we thank you that we are so privileged to see this promise of cleansing dramatized in the sacrament of baptism. And We pray that as we see the water being poured over Sienna's head, that we might be reminded that our sins are laundered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, through which we are cleansed. And that in the Lord Jesus Christ and through faith in him, you declare us to be innocent of wrongdoing because Jesus has paid the penalty for sin. We pray that as we proceed through this worship service and enter into this new week, that we might understand afresh that there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we pray that over the course of this worship service, through the sacrament of baptism that we are privileged to witness, and through our prayers and our songs and our speaking, we pray that this gospel reality, this good news reality, might be impressed upon us so we can leave this facility and enter into this new week with joy in our hearts that cannot 
be dislodged by all of the difficulties and complexities of this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Gerben and Kaylee have requested baptism for their infant daughter, Sienna Eden. And it's important for us before Sienna is baptized to remind ourselves of the meaning of baptism, the significance of baptism. And I have notes here somewhere about this baptism. And I can't find them. But that's okay. You know, I don't know how many of you know this, but in the ancient world, people had a very dim view of children. We often think of Aristotle, for example, as this great philosopher, and it's so interesting that though he is from centuries ago, he's still highly regarded by scholars today, and yet Aristotle thought it was perfectly acceptable for a father to abandon an unwanted child perfectly acceptable. Infanticide was common in the ancient world. And you have these Roman statesmen like Cicero and Seneca who chastise fathers for grieving over lost children as if it were something unethical or wicked to do. They are chastised for grieving over the death of children. I think it's all the more remarkable then that when we read the Gospels and see Jesus doing his work in this ancient world where children were not highly regarded, to find an episode in his ministry where he invites the children forward. And parents, you may know the story, Mark 10. Parents were bringing their children to Jesus to be blessed by him. They recognized that he was a prophetic figure, a priestly figure in some ways, And the disciples rebuked these parents. Jesus is an important person. He's doing very important work. And parents are, are, uh, these parents are getting in the way of these, this important work that Jesus is doing. And what does Jesus say? He says, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Boy, that must have been shocking for people in the Greco-Roman world, but it shouldn't have been shocking for the disciples who were raised in Israel. Because, of course, in the Bible, we discover that God isn't an adults-only God. He's a God who, when he establishes a relationship with us, also establishes a relationship with our children. The word that we use for that in the Bible is covenant, this particular familial, intimate relationship of mutual love. And in the Old Testament, the sign of that relationship, the sign of that covenant was circumcision. And in the New Testament, that is baptism. Baptism replaces circumcision. But baptism, like circumcision, is a sign and a seal. And when we say it's a sign, we're saying it points to something beyond itself. The washing with water points to the blood of Christ that cleanses us from our sins. This Baptism as a seal confirms God's promises. And the central promise that God makes to us is this, that he will be our God and we will be his people. You know, when God meets Moses in the burning bush, he says, I am who I am. There's an Old Testament scholar, Bruce Waltke, who says that when God says those words, he is saying, I am who I am for you. I am Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for you. And that's precisely the message that God speaks to Sienna this morning. God, as a triune God, makes promises. The Father promises that he will adopt Sienna into his family. God the Son promises that he will wash away Sienna's sins and unite her to himself. God the Holy Spirit promises that he will apply the great things that Jesus has done for Sienna and over her life purify her and sanctify her. And as in the case, as is the case in the Bible, wherever you have promises, you also have responsibilities. And Sienna, therefore, is to cling to this one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. She is to love him with heart, soul, mind, and strength, 
to love her neighbor as herself. When she sins, she must confess her sins and repent of them. And Gerben and Kaylee, of course, have the responsibility to raise Sienna in the light of this reality. Matthew Henry, so famous for his uh, Bible commentary, said on one occasion that parents should discipline their children by baptism. They should literally, he said, they should grab their children by their baptisms and remind them, look, you are adopted into the family of God. And if you're a son or a daughter, this is how you ought to behave. So we are so privileged uh, this morning to witness the administration of baptism. We recognize, of course, that the waters of baptism have no power on their own. And so before we have uh, Sienna baptized, we're going to pray that God would bless this sacrament for Sienna, for her family, and for all who are present this morning. Let's pray together. Our dear Lord, we thank you again for this uh, beautiful privilege that we have of seeing the gospel dramatized in this particular way. And we are grateful for this little girl, this precious little girl, a daughter for Gerben and Kaylee, but also your daughter. And we realize that baptism, baptism is in some way a formal adoption ceremony by which children are inducted into your family and into this covenant relationship. And we pray that her baptism might prove meaningful for Sienna over the course of her life. We do not know at this point what the future holds for this little girl, but we pray that her life would be full of joy and happiness and gratitude. We pray that if she ever veers from the path that you would bring her back, we pray that you would equip Gerben and Kaylee, for their responsibilities of raising Sienna and their other children in the fear of your name. We pray that you would give them persistence and diligence and perseverance when they grow weary in doing good. And we pray that very soon Sienna would be able to sing songs to you, pray to you, love you, express her love for you and for others. And we pray that she would prove to be a loyal disciple of Jesus, and a faithful daughter of yours. We are so grateful that we can be joined by family and friends and so many people to celebrate this moment, and we pray that you are glorified by it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I can't find my sheet with the questions, and so I'm, do, do we have the questions projected? No, we don't. Um, does anyone have a book of praise? No. Uh, I do have one downstairs. I had a sheet with info about the baptism, and I've totally misplaced it. That never happens. <laughs> yes, that's one right there. Look at that. Matt's even going to try to find the page for me, and he has. Thank you very much. Sorry about that, Gerben and Kaylee. Uh, can you please stand for these questions? <clears throat> Dear Gerben and Kaylee, beloved in Christ, you've heard that baptism is an ordinance of the Lord our God to seal to us and our children his covenant. We must therefore use this sacrament for that purpose and not out of custom or superstition. That it may be clear then that you desire baptism for the right purpose, you are to answer sincerely to the following questions. First, do you confess that our children, though conceived and born in sin, and therefore subject to all sorts of misery, even to condemnation, are sanctified in Christ and thus as members of his church ought to be baptized? Second, do you confess that the doctrine of the Old and New Testament summarized in the Apostles' Creed and taught here in this church, is the true and complete doctrine of salvation. And third, do you promise as father and mother to instruct your child in this doctrine as soon as she is able to understand and to have her instructed therein to the utmost of your power? Gerben, what is your answer? Kaylee, what is your answer? Please present Sienna.
Sienna, Eden, Degelder, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to say a little prayer for Sienna with Gerben and Kaylee, and then we're going to celebrate this moment in song. Let's pray together. Our dear Lord, in this moment we remember how Jesus, before his disciples, took the children of those parents who brought them to Jesus to be blessed into his arms and blessed them. And we thank you, therefore, for your love for children and your love in particular this morning for Sienna. We pray that you would walk with her in her life, that you would be a refuge for her, a rock for her. We pray that she would understand soon the reality of the work of Jesus, the good news of his coming, of his suffering, his dying, his rising, his ascending into heaven, his being seated at your right hand, his mediation. And we pray that she would recognize that you will never abandon her, you will never disappoint her, but that she can always trust in you and always confide in you. And we pray that you would fill her life, therefore, with abundant blessing. Please supply the DeGelders, Gerben and Kaylee, and their family a rich measure of your grace to be faithful and fruitful parents in this complex world. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to celebrate this moment in song, and as we sing, of course, the young children are dismissed for Calvary's Kids Club and Little Kids Club, and we're going to sing, Loving Shepherd of Thy Sheep will stand as we sing. morning we are continuing our sermon series titled Wrestling with God and the title for this particular sermon is How Will God Triumph Through This? This being the calamity that the prophet Habakkuk anticipates and God will triumph through calamity and that's of course a message that the Apostle Paul brings in the New Testament in Romans chapter 8. We are 
the Apostle says, in the midst of all kinds of calamities, more than conquerors. And I'm going to invite Hank forward, and he's going to read Romans 8, 37 through 39, before we turn to Habakkuk chapter 3. Just before the passage we're going to read, Paul asked the question, can anything separate us from the love of Christ? So then when we start verse 37, God's Word, it starts with an emphatic no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. I invite you, if you have Bibles with you, to turn to Habakkuk chapter 3, or else you can read the text as it is projected on the screens in the sanctuary. You will notice, as we read this chapter, that it has the character of a psalm, and there are some curious parallels between Habakkuk 3 and Psalm 77, which may have inspired the prophet to write this psalm. We're going to read it in its entirety. It is identified as a prayer, Habakkuk chapter 3, and as I mentioned a moment ago, the message is titled, How Will God Triumph Through This? Habakkuk 3, listen to these words. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigionoth. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day, in our time. Make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens, and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. Plague went before him. Pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled, the age-old hills collapsed, collapsed, but he marches on forever. I saw the tents of Cushion in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. Were you angry with the rivers, Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode your horses and your chariots to victory? You uncovered your bow, you called for many arrows, you split the earth with rivers, The mountains saw you and writhed, torrents of water swept by, the deep roared and lifted its waves on high. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows, at the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath you strode through the earth, and in anger you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. With his own spear you pierced his head. When his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding, you trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. I heard, and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones, and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity, to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights for the director of music, 
on my stringed instruments. This is the word of the Lord. If you've never been to Campfire Bible Camp, you're off the hook this morning. But if you have been to Campfire Bible Camp, I want you to finish for me this slogan. God is good, and all the time, is that true? Huh, yes. Very, very good. Very good blessings and guess. It's something we say from time to time, God is good. When are we likely to say it? We're likely to say it when things are going well. When the sun is shining, God is good. I want to ask you this morning, is this something we can say when it rains? Or let me put the question in an even more challenging way. Is God still good when you're sick? Is God still good when there's war? Is God still good when there's crime? Is God still good when there's hardship, when there's suffering? I do believe that the Bible teaches that God is good all the time. It's easy for us to say but I think it's much more difficult for us to believe, especially when things are dark and depressing and difficult. It's a lesson that Habakkuk learns over the course of his life. It's a lesson that he imparts to us this morning. And if you haven't been here for the past two weeks, you need to know a little bit of the context. The book begins with Habakkuk writhing his uh, hands in frustration because he looks around at his society, and he sees rampant injustice. And he says, doesn't God see all the injustice around me? Where is God in this? And the Lord responds to that question by saying, I see the injustice of your people, Habakkuk, and I'm going to respond with justice. I'm going to raise up the Babylonians who are going to chastise and discipline the Israelites and take them into captivity. And of course, that then prompts a second question on the part of Habakkuk, and that is, how could God do this? Because though the people of Israel were unjust and wicked, the Babylonians were far more unjust and far more wicked. They were cruel barbarians. And Habakkuk's question is, how in the world does this make sense for one nation to be punished and disciplined by another nation which is yet more cruel and unjust than the first? And the Lord responds to that question by saying, don't worry, Habakkuk, the predator will become the prey. And I'm going to see to it that the cruel and barbarian Babylonians are also judged and brought to justice. I'm going to give them the cup of wrath to drink. I'm going to turn their glory to shame. I'm going to overthrow this imperial kingdom, this, this empire, this cruel empire. Well, there's still one more question to answer, and that's how will God triumph through this? And Habakkuk obtains clarity about that question in this prayer that he offers in the third and final chapter. And we want to be attentive to this prayer. And we want to notice the four parts of the prayer and the particular sequence that these parts have because they are so instructive for us. We see, first of all, that Habakkuk will re request God's revival. Secondly, remember God's deliverance. Thirdly, respond to God's judgment. And finally, rejoice in God's salvation. There are four movements to this song, all of which are important, all of which contribute to Habakkuk's understanding and finally generate his joy in a time of complexity. Several years ago, Anne Lamott, an excellent writer, wrote a book on prayer titled, Wow, Thanks, Help which she believed were three 
essential words to guide us in prayer. And if you this morning are learning to pray, well, these are three excellent words to help you along the way. What do you say when you pray? You say, wow. Take note of the amazing and astonishing things that God is doing in the world and that God is doing in your life. Say, thanks. Identify those things in your life for which you should be grateful. Say help. Identify those areas in your life where you need God's help and assistance. I really think that the book could be enhanced by a fourth word, oops, identifying our shortcomings. Well, in this particular prayer, Habakkuk begins with wow. He stands in awe at the Lord's deeds. God is going to respond to the injustice in Israel by sending the Babylonians to discipline them, take them into captivity. Then he's going to deal with the cruelty and the injustices of Babylon. He's going to overthrow this empire. He is going to judge them. And Habakkuk, I get the sense, in this chapter is on his knees. And he's amazed He stands in awe. He trembles at the perfect justice of God. He stands in awe at the Lord's deeds, and now he says, repeat them in our time. Make them known again. And the the Hebrew verb that lies beneath our English translation, repeat, most often means to restore to life, which is why In other Bible translations, you have the word revive. Revive your works, O Lord. Make your presence, your pity, your providence known. Display yourself, reveal yourself. Revive your work. Habakkuk says, in our time, and the Hebrew literally has there, in the midst of years. Revive your work in the midst of years. And that phrase, the midst of years, refers to the interval between promise and fulfillment. God has promised Habakkuk that he will punish those cruel Babylonians who will take the Israelites captive. But there's going to be a large gap in time before that ever happens. And Habakkuk knows that those are going to be very difficult days, which is why this prayer is probably composed for those Jews who would live in Babylonian captivity. It was a prayer for them to pray in the dark days of captivity because things were bad. And before they would get better, they would get worse. So Habakkuk prays, you are the powerful God who judges the earth and liberate your people, revive your work, and reveal yourself. Now, the interesting thing for us is that we also live in the midst of years. We also live in the interval between promise and fulfillment. Jesus has come, but before Jesus left, before Jesus ascended, he promised he would return. And when Jesus returns, he's going to judge the living and the dead, this very awesome and terrifying moment when the world will be summoned before him as judge, and then he will unveil a new creation in which evil and suffering are absent. We live in the midst of years, we live in the interval between promise and fulfillment, and the interval can be difficult. In this time, as we await the second coming of Jesus, we can endure dark and disturbing days. We can face all kinds of trouble and tragedy. The Bible suggests that prior to the return of Christ, things in the world and even in the church will get quite depressing. There will be a period of apathy and and, uh, lethargy. I was going to say liturgy. Lethargy. There will be desertions and defections and apostasy and people forsaking the faith. There are seasons in history where it seems as if God withdraws from history, where it seems as if he's silent, where it seems as if he's inactive. And in those seasons, we pray as Habakkuk does here, revive your work, restore life, make yourself known, 
shake things up in the world, shake things up in the church. Jesus, uh, you know, tells his disciples, it's Mark 13, that he is like the owner of a house who goes away and then eventually returns. But before he goes away, he puts his servants in charge. And he says, you don't know when the owner of the house is going to return. He might return in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. He refers to what the Romans called the four watches of the night. But he said, he better not find you asleep when he returns. We are in the midst of years in the interval between promise and fulfillment. We don't know whether we're in the first watch or the second watch or the third watch or the fourth watch of the night. But in every instance, we have to be on guard. We have to be alert. We have to be looking for Jesus. We can't be sleeping Because when Jesus returns, he will judge the living and the dead. That's not something we want to think about much. I think it is something we should. There are terrifying depictions of judgment in the Bible, and many of them are in the New Testament. You know, I as a pastor, I don't want to mention these passages. I don't want to preach on them. I think I have to. They're not exactly heartwarming. They're not exactly feel-good passages, but they're inspired by the Holy Spirit. They speak to us with authority. Here is what Paul writes to the Thessalonians. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Now Habakkuk has recognized because the Lord has told him that God's eyes are too pure to look upon evil. He cannot tolerate injustice. He is going to give those cruel barbarian Babylonians a cup to drink, and the cup is full of his wrath. It's full of his anger. He's going to insist that they drink it. That's why he concludes the previous chapter by saying, the Lord is in his holy temple at all earth. Be silent before him. And so he's praying for revival, for God to revive his work, to make himself known, to display his glory. And he concludes his prayer for revival, end of verse 2, in wrath, remember mercy. We know that your wrath is going to be apparent in history, Habakkuk, but please remember mercy. Not remember our merit, remember your mercy. Not remember our accomplishments, but remember your grace. And he's emboldened in this prayer, and what encourages him but the remembrance of God's deliverances. He looks back on history as a ground for his present prayer, thinks about how God was merciful in times past, those great things he did on Israel's behalf to rescue her when she was in trouble. And I just love the way that this section begins in verse 3. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. God came from Teman. God showed up. And you know, those uh, places, Teman and Mount Paran, are associated with the Sinai Mountains, associated with God giving his law at Sinai. And so we're to think back, of course, to the great exodus when the people of Israel were in Egyptian slavery and God showed up. Showed up with power. Showed up to defeat their enemy. Showed up to liberate the Israelites. And this, you understand, was the gospel in the Old Testament. If you were to identify the gospel in the New Testament, you would talk about the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the gospel in the Old Testament was the exodus. That was the great moment where God proved his love for his people, defeated their enemies, rescued the people. And if you read through Habakkuk 3, you see countless 
references to the Exodus, the plagues, the Red Sea, Sinai, the conquest, refers to plague, pestilence, verse 5, the shaking of the ground at Sinai, verses 8 and 15, Red Sea crossing uh, in verses 8 and 15, sorry, the, the shaking of the ground is, is verse 6. The sun standing still, verse 11, for Joshua at Gibeon. Pharaoh is described, verse 13, as the leader of the land of wickedness who was humbled. God brought about these remarkable deliverances in the past, and he has not changed. He is the same. He does not change. And so the past becomes an encouragement for the present. The past is the ground upon which Habakkuk can pray this present petition. Well, I want to ask you this morning, what grounds our prayers today? What grounds your prayers? Also something in the past. But what grounds our prayers is, of course, the deliverance that Jesus accomplished. And Jesus and Moses talked about this. You say, wait a minute, when did Jesus and Moses talk with each other? Well, we're told in the Bible in, in uh, what is it, Mark chapter 9, the story of the transfiguration of Jesus. Jesus is there and Moses is there and Elijah is there. And it says in Luke 9, 31, Jesus talked with Moses and Elijah about, our translation has departure, the Greek word is exodus. Jesus talked with Moses and Elijah about his exodus. Because Moses, of course, led the people of Israel through a fantastic exodus. Pharaoh and his armies being drowned in the Red Sea. Israel going through the Red Sea on dry ground, through the wilderness, ultimately into the promised land. But Jesus says, I've got my own exodus that I'm busy with. And of course, later in that very chapter, we read that Jesus set his face resolutely towards Jerusalem to accomplish this greater exodus, delivering people not simply from human tyrants or human bondage and slavery, but from the slavery of sin and from the slavery of death. And how did Jesus accomplish that liberation? Well, he told his disciples that he came to give his life as a ransom for many. And that word ransom is the price that a person would pay to free a slave. And Jesus, by dying on the cross, shedding his blood, pays the ransom fee so we could be free from the power, the dark powers of sin and evil and death. Moses knew it. And the question is, do you? Moses worshipped Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration because of it. And the question is, do you similarly worship Jesus? Well, Habakkuk remembers God's deliverances. He also responds, third point, to God's judgment. He knows that God is a cup of anger for the nations to drink and it's filled with God's wrath. And how does he respond? Verse 16, I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. The Hebrew has my bowels trembled. I hope I don't need to explain what that means. His lips quivered. His knees shook together. He trembled when he thought about God's awesome judgment on the Babylonians, let alone the Israelites. Trembled at the thought of God making those cruel, wicked nations drink the cup of his wrath. It reminds me of what Job says, I am troubled at his presence, God's presence. When I consider, I am afraid of him. Moses 
trembles at the presence of God at Sinai. Peter trembles when Jesus walks on the water. Jesus himself trembles in the Garden of Gethsemane contemplating the cup of God's wrath. I wonder whether you tremble. The Apostle Paul says to the Thessalonians, he will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut up from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. I want you to notice with me that he doesn't just tremble, he trusts. This isn't just fear, this is faith. What does he go on to say? Verse 16b, yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come upon the nation invading us. He trembles and yet he trusts. He's gripped by fear, but also by faith. He will wait patiently because he knows what God is up to, and he trusts that God is good and just. He's going to execute justice. He's going to rescue his people. He's going to deliver them. And this is, of course, what God's judgments ought to generate in us. Fear, absolutely, but also faith. And the Apostle Paul also says to the Thessalonians, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what makes Habakkuk rejoice. Fourthly, lastly, he rejoices in God's salvation. Habakkuk realizes that this great empire is going to crush Israel. And when they crush Israel, there's not going to be, he says, this is verse 17, no fig, no wine, no cattle, no sheep. There will be, because of the Babylonian invasion, societal demise and collapse, and in all probability, starvation. Nothing to eat off the vines and fig trees. No animals to eat, no sheep, no cattle, nothing. Absolute societal collapse. What does Habakkuk say say next? Verse 17, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The most instructive part of the song where Habakkuk essentially says when all is gone, God is not gone. When all is gone, God is not gone. Because we are all prone to idolatry, aren't we? What's idolatry? Idolatry involves us as humans looking to created things for that which only God can provide. Looking to created things for the things that only God can provide. Happiness, contentment, security, satisfaction. Where do you look for happiness? Health? Beauty? Fame? Money? Marriage? Family? Church? Where do you look for happiness? What the Bible says is that every single idol disappoints. Because no created thing can do that which only God can do, provide these things of deep and immense significance. Idols make great promises, and they always disappoint. But there is someone, Habakkuk says, who doesn't disappoint. When all your idols have abandoned you, and you're broke, and you're lonely, and you're sick, and you're dying, and you have nothing or nobody, Jesus will still be standing there. When all is gone, God is not gone. When there are no figs, no vines, no cattle, no sheep, yet I will rejoice in God, my Savior. 
When all is gone, God is not gone, and God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. And all of this, I think, is really dramatically presented to us in the baptism of Siena. Because God is, has done something for her this morning that should cause her to rejoice every day of her life. And of course, we want and pray for the best for Sienna. We want her days to be filled with happiness and joy and gratitude and family and friends, health, goodness. But this morning, God has formally adopted her as his daughter. And the fact is, if she were to be deprived over the course of her life of every earthly comfort, she would still have the triune God who keeps his covenant. She would still have the Lord, even if she were to lose everything, be abandoned somewhere in a time of war, whatever, we don't want to think of these things, of course not, she would still have the triune God who keeps his covenant. Though he faces the worst of calamities, Habakkuk is positively giddy. Verse 19, the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Would you like your feet to be like the feet of a deer? There's someone in my family who likes to play this game. I don't know what it's called, but it's an either-or game. Would you rather have one leg or two legs like a deer? Do you know this game? It's really silly, but it's kind of fun. Would you want the feet of a deer? You say, I don't want the feet of a deer, but it's a metaphor. To tread on the heights, to walk surely on mountaintops, I think these mountain goats uh, that you sometimes, if you go to Alberta, oh, there are other places in the world as well, you see these mountain goats walking on very narrow mountain ledges. It's very frightening. And you want to say to those mountain goats, hey, get off that little ledge, you're going to fall. Of all the places that a mountain goat could go, why does he stand on a little ledge where he barely fits his feet? But for the mountain goat, you see, it's a place of safety. And it's a place where you can see really far. There's no place where a mountain goat is safer than when he's treading on the mountain heights. I suspect that's what Habakkuk is saying as he concludes this psalm. You've made my feet like the feet of a deer so I can be on the mountaintops in that place where I am safe. With God my Savior, with a perspective. I can see far. And when I see far, he says, I realize that my, my imminent sufferings are not worth comparing with the future glory that is to come. When I stand in that place, that little place of safety where I can see, I realize that what God works good for those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. In that place of safety and sight, I ask myself, if God is for us, who can be against us? When all is gone, God is not gone. Of course, Paul in Romans 8 answers that question. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Could God do any more to prove your love, his love for you, than giving up his one and only son? And if he's given up the greatest thing he could possibly give, well, why wouldn't he give you the little things? Paul asks, verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Listen, shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? His answer is no, no. And all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. God is good even in hardship, even in trouble, even in persecution. 
even in nakedness, even in famine, even in peril, you name it, God is still good. And that's because there's nothing that can ever dislodge us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Isn't that something? You experience the worst that the world has to throw at you, and it still can't dislodge God's love for you in Christ Jesus. When all is gone, God is not gone. And when all the idols of our lives disappoint us, when we worship health and become sick, worship fame, become nobodies, worship beauty, become disfigured, worship money, become poor, worship friends, become... When all of our idols let us down and disappoint us, Jesus is still standing there And Jesus is the brother of Sienna and her Savior and our Savior who loves us more than we'll ever know. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we, like Habakkuk, want to be in this place of safety and sight where we feel protected against enemies who try to sabotage us where we can see into the future have our bearings right to make sense of the darkness of the difficulties of the troubles of the tragedies that we do encounter in process it really is an amazing thought this morning, Father, that we'll never, ever be able to understand the height, the depth, the breadth, the width of your love for us, so great, so beyond the finite categories we imagine. And we pray this morning that we would fear you as the God of infinite holiness and perfect justice. We pray even more that we would have faith in you, in the promises you disclose, in the Son whom you sent to be our Savior. Draw us closer to him, enable us to surrender our lives to him and to trust him because he knows best and he loves us best. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing in response, uh, Lord, I've heard the tidings.
was a fantastic hymn, wasn't it? Didn't it sound familiar to you? Thank you to Matt, our music director, who always picks the songs and does a fantastic job. I didn't realize that there was a hymn that was based on Habakkuk 3. I should have known better. Uh, Today, as we pray for our congregation and city, we're going to pray for those who are in our Christianity Explored class, which runs Thursday nights. And of course, last night, we had another uh, seminar and dinner for international students from McMaster and Mohawk, who come, the students that come are mainly from uh, India, but also from Afghanistan, Iran, uh, South America, China, and it was wonderful to have them here last night and for us to spend time together and learn from each other. We want to pray for them this morning as well. Let's pray together. Our dear Lord, we thank you that Jesus is the great high priest, that he wears an ephod that has our names engraved on it so that when he appears before you as our intercessor and mediator, he does so with our names over his heart. We thank you that he is a faithful high priest who's intimately familiar with even the minutia of our lives. He has the hairs on our head numbered. He is thoroughly familiar with our rising and our going to sleep, with our movements throughout the day. And even with all of that familiarity, he loves us, prays for us, pleads our case before you, the Father. And we know that when he makes his case, he has a great portfolio, namely his work on the cross, his death, his payment for sin, his defeat of evil, his dethroning of the dark powers. We pray that you would enable us over this week to learn more about Jesus and in learning more about Jesus to love him more. We pray for those who are in Christianity Explored and we're grateful for this group of individuals uh, exploring the claims of Jesus, learning more about who he is, what he, what he did, what he does, what he wants from us. We pray that you would shepherd them along the way so that their love for Jesus might increase as well. We thank you for the group of international students that we could house here last night, or sorry, Friday night, and for these individuals who live far from home, far from family, but are here in this country. We thank you for the time we could spend together, for the lessons we could impart to each other, and we pray that you would be with all internationals in our city, refugees, international students, people who are far from home, and we pray that we might show them such hospitality that those who are far from home might still feel at home. We thank you for our church and for all the things that we enjoy through it, for small groups, for small group leaders who allocate time and, and are so dedicated to our well-being and welfare. We thank you for our elders, our deacons, our leaders, our pastors who care more for us than we'll ever realize as well. We thank you for their investment in us. and We pray for them. We pray that their work would not be a burden but a joy. We pray for all of the diverse activities going on at Blessings, for the YAC uh, group that will meet, be meeting momentarily, for the women's pastoral team, for the outreach team, for operations board, audiovisual, so much activity, so much people, so much demand on time and energy. Please give us, supply us the strength and the grace we need to embrace all of these responsibilities for the promotion of the gospel and for the advance of the kingdom of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We do pray for our city this morning, for our newly elected mayor, Andrew Horwath, for our local uh, Ward 1 city councillor, Maureen Wilson, and for all other city councillors across our city, please supply them wisdom and grace as they begin either their office for the first time or for a second, third, or fourth time. Enable, enable them to govern us well within this city. We thank you for this time, for this opportunity to worship you, for speaking to us, please receive our worship in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You now have the opportunity to worship the Lord with your gifts. There will be a brief musical interlude in which you can 
e-transfer to the deacons, deacons at blessingshamilton.ca, and uh, a portion of the funds collected will go to our deacons who then distribute funds to people in our church and community who are needy, and a portion will also go to Helping Hands Street Mission, which is located on Barton Street and is a mission for people in the neighborhood. If you're a guest with us this morning, we ask nothing of you. We're just so grateful that you're here, and uh, you can just sit back and enjoy the musical interlude. By the, uh, lastly, there's a box at the back of the church where you can make a monetary contribution if you've come here with money to contribute this morning. Please stand for the closing benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Let's conclude this worship by singing together, Blessed be your name. Difficult for you there.
worship with you this morning. We'll see you all tonight at 6.30 for our youth-led worship service.